Welcome to Ancient Philosophy Lecture 19. So today we're going to discuss Aristotle's views on incontinence, why that is philosophically interesting. We'll discuss Aristotle's views of freedom, how that fits in with how we think of desire on Aristotle's model, and then we're going to turn to a difficult subject and look at Aristotle's argument in defense of slavery in Book 1 of The Politics. So let's go ahead and jump in to our discussion of incontinence. So Aristotle addresses incontinence in Book 6 of the Nicomachean Ethics. In terms of what I would like you to read, focus on chapter 7 in that book. In general, incontinence is the lack of continence. It's the lack of self-discipline or self-restraint. It's when one acts against one's own interest, acts against one's own judgment. Now, the philosophical interest in incontinence lies in that a person decides a course of action is best, but then that person acts against that judgment. And so we want to know how is that sort of case possible? Socrates in Plato's Dialogue Protagoras argues that no one can knowingly do what is not for the best, where Socrates judges that a particular action is for the best for a person, so that person judges and knows that a particular action is for the best, but they decide to do something else. Socrates thinks that that's not possible. We can see initially, you know, why we might think that's not possible. After all, Right? If you judge that you have a bunch of different options, and one option that you can do in addition to doing the other options, which you can equally do, you judge that one is for the best, all things considered, given all your interest, but you decide not to do that thing to do another thing, then that doesn't make any sense. So what we want to focus on is we want to focus on philosophical incontinence. And what we're doing here is we are just narrowing down the range of incontinence. What we'll see in the next slide is that there are a wider phenomenon of sort of acting against one's interest. And we don't want to be talking about that wider phenomenon. We want to talk about a very specific phenomenon that is philosophically interesting. So let's call philosophical incontinence the kind of incontinence that meets these conditions. So we're, con we're considering a case where an agent performs an action intentionally, right? They choose to perform that action and that's something that they do. It's not something that happens to them or something that is forced upon them. Another condition is that the agent believes that there's an alternative action that's available to them and they could do that thing. So again, this isn't a case of where this is the only option that they could perform. And the third condition is that the agent judges that all things considered, it would be better to do the alternative act rather than the act that the person does perform. So these are our three conditions for philosophical incontinence. So I want to ask, why is incontinence a philosophical puzzle? You might think, look, we judge all the time that we ought to do a particular action and we end up not doing that particular action. Now, we need to understand that philosophical incontinence isn't just acting against one's own judgment. So, considering this very delicious looking piece of carrot cake here, I might judge that I ought not eat that cake. And in a sense, that's part of my deliberation. There's a judgment there that I ought not to eat that cake, but I also know that I will really enjoy eating that cake. It will provide me with lots of satisfaction. And so the more general phenomenon there is one of what's called acrasia or weakness of the will. It's a case in which my all things considered judgment, you might say in the particular moment, given that I have a very strong desire to eat this piece of carrot cake that my all things considered judgment is that still this is the thing that I should do. I should eat the cake. Now, we might think I wasn't giving proper due to my other standing desires, but in that particular moment, we could understand that my all things considered judgment was that I should eat the cake. Now, the reason that philosophical incontinence is, is interesting is, of course, related to this, because we understand action in terms of a complicated network of a person's beliefs and desires and values. When we think of intentional action, action that an agent performs, we want that action to look reasonable from the agent's point of view. Now, of course, we can take different perspectives. We can consider an agent's point of view at a particular time, or we can consider an agent's point of view at a longer stretch of time. And a lot of the common cases of acrasia or weakness of will are cases in which we're thinking about an agent's perspective from a long point of time. So if you have a standing desire to run a marathon, 
then that standing desire might be contravailed by a very strong desire in the moment to eat a piece of cake. Now this isn't philosophical incontinence because at that particular moment, right, you've judged that eating the cake is something that you may do or you should do. Now the reason philosophical incontinence is interesting is that when we're thinking of a case in which a person has an alternative action before them that they can perform and that this action they judge all things considered to be the action that is best and yet they perform another action. This threatens the picture of rationality that underlies intentional action. And so that's why we are interested in incontinence. Okay, so let's look at Aristotle's solution. I have solution there in quotes because I don't think it's a real solution to philosophical incontinence. So remember Aristotle's view of practical deliberation. Practical deliberation works by having a fixed end and then reasoning about how that end can be achieved in the particular circumstance and then the, the desire for the end transfers to the means. So let's look at this particular case. So suppose you have before you a steak and you reason that the steak ought not to be eaten. Suppose that's a standing policy or standing desire of yours. Then you have a steak before you and so the conclusion of this practical syllogism is that this thing before me ought not to be eaten and yet in this case you go ahead and you eat the steak. So this does conflict with Aristotle's view of practical deliberation because given that view what should happen is that your standing desire not to eat steak, your recognition that this is steak, should transfer then to the desire not to eat this particular thing. Now one of the moves that Aristotle makes is that he draws a distinction between two ways of knowing. This distinction will be familiar to us from our discussion in Plato's Theaetetus where we looked at the Avery model where Plato distinguishes the sense between having a bird in the hand and having a bird in the Avery. And so knowledge can be held in two different ways. Knowledge can be stored in memory and then knowledge can be held in active contemplation. And so Aristotle thinks that there's a sense in which you can act against your judgment in a sense in which philosophical incontinence is possible is that you know one that the steak ought not to be eaten you know this because it's in memory, it's a standing belief of yours, but you don't actively contemplate it at the time. Aristotle says that passion may block this knowledge from being actively contemplated. So one feature of Aristotle's discussion of incontinence right, is, is he distinguishes incontinence from just bad action. So bad action is a complete failure of a person's character that it's such a failure that they don't even notice that that action is bad. Whereas with incontinence, there's a conflict between your beliefs about what you ought to do and what in fact you do do. So he thinks that incontinence will be noticed. Now another idea Aristotle has about how philosophical incontinence is possible is that it's a failure of lack of self-knowledge about what you really desire. And so let's return to the steak example. Suppose you reason this way. Suppose you reason that I do not desire to eat steak, this is a steak, and so I do not desire to eat steak. And yet you go ahead and eat steak. Aristotle says one way in which that's possible is that you have a false belief about what your desires are, and so you lack some kind of self-knowledge. Okay, so notice that on both of those solutions where you lack self-knowledge and also where the knowledge isn't actively held that that is not a solution to philosophical incontinence. Aristotle doesn't allow for a case of incontinence where you're actively contemplating that particular item of knowledge, and he doesn't allow for a case of incontinence where you actually do know what it is that you desire. And so there's a vast philosophical literature on this under the heading of weakness of the will or incontinent. If you're interested in that for a final paper, let me know and I'll find some resources for you. Okay, so let's change directions and talk about Aristotle's conception of a virtuous person and human freedom. So remember that a virtuous person is continent. They have self-restraint. A virtuous person can also manifest a particular kind of human freedom where they reflectively endorse their own character. They reflect on their desires and they reflect on their goals and they come to endorse the person that they are. This endorsement is both an expression of human freedom and an expression of the desires that they have. So how is it possible for reflective endorsement to be both an expression of human freedom and also an expression of desire? 
So let's compare Aristotle's virtuous person to an SS officer. So Aristotle lays down three conditions for reflective endorsement to be free. The first condition is that a person's character must not be the product of coercion. So a person who is born into a Nazi regime that faces propaganda from the birth up and their character is a reflection of that propaganda will fail condition one. Their character is not the product of reason, it's the product of coercion. Now you might wonder how that fits in with the fact that culture produces individuals and characters. And in, in Aristotle's politics, that is a good concern because Aristotle thinks that a good constitution ought to develop a person's character in virtuous ways. So the second condition for reflective endorsement to be free is that reflective endorsement must itself be more than a desire urging itself forward. So let's distinguish between blind desires and desires that are not blind, that fit in with reason. What Aristotle says here is that for the reflective endorsement to be free, it has to be a structured desire that fits in with an overall rational account. And Aristotle thinks that in the virtuous person, this is met. The third condition here is that the reflection must be accurate and sensitive to the truth. This is the main condition that will distinguish the Nazi officer's reflective endorsement of his own character and his actions from the virtuous person's endorsement of his own character and action. In this case, the Nazi officer is reasoning from false views, and that makes it the case that his reflective endorsement is not free. So this raises a really interesting philosophical question about whether we are ever in a position to know that reflective endorsement of our own character is itself free given sociological facts about the way in which society and culture can influence one's own moral judgments and one's, more broadly one judge, one's judgments about values. It's a truth about very many people that if they were to grow up in a different age or a different culture, they would have very different moral beliefs. So think about what kind of moral beliefs you would have if you were born just 50 years ago or if you were born 100 years ago most likely you would have moral beliefs that are reflective of the age in which you were raised. So there's a real challenge here, not just for Aristotle, but for everyone to realize how much culture and society can influence the moral beliefs that we have. So on this topic, I want to give a plug for The Man in High Castle, which is a TV show on Amazon Prime. It's a TV show based on Philip Dick's alternative history of America if the Nazis and the Japanese would have won World War II. And the show gives you a very careful and nuanced presentation of what it would be like for many different people to live in the Japanese Empire and the Reich in America in the late 1950s and 1960s. It is a sobering depiction of individuals in, their very, in the very complexities of their lives as they have become indoctrinated to the Nazi propaganda. So on this score, let us now look at Aristotle's discussion of slavery in book one of The Politics. Now, I would really encourage you to go and read this for yourself. So book one of Aristotle's politics mounts a defense of slavery. It's a limited defense, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it's a defense nonetheless. Aristotle is aware of a debate about whether any person by nature is a slave. So he quotes Alcimedes, who is a student of Gorgias, the sophist. Alcimedes says, nature never made any man a slave. So Aristotle discusses this at the end of Politics, Book 1, Chapter 3. So in Book 4, he begins to discuss generally property and slavery. So he says it's clear from these considerations what the nature and capacity of a slave are. For anyone who, despite being human, is by nature not his own, but someone else's is a natural slave. And he is someone else's when, despite being human, he is a piece of property. And a piece of property is a tool for action that is separate from its owner. What Aristotle writes here is very difficult to read. It's especially difficult knowing the role that Aristotle's writings here have had in the history of the West and in the justification for slavery. But even so, we can sharpen our own convictions by analyzing Aristotle's argument. Aristotle's argument occurs in Politics Book 1, Chapter 5. And I would encourage you just to read that section. I'm not going to read it out loud. By my lights, Aristotle is reasoning like this. So he starts with a claim that we've seen in both Plato and Aristotle, that there are different parts within an individual person, and the part that shares the most in reason is right to rule over the parts that share less in reason. So we saw in Plato's Republic 
the tripartite nature of the soul, that there is reason, and there is the spirit, and there are the appetites. And reason needs to rule over the appetites and needs to rule over the spirited part of a person so that it forms a organic unity, a comprehensive whole where each part plays its role and flourishes as an entity. Aristotle has a similar sense that the function of, per of a person is to reason well. And reasoning is the foundation of his view of what it is to flourish, what it is to be well, is to use reason well. So the next step that Aristotle takes is to say, well, similarly, between people, persons who share more in reason are right to rule over persons who share less in reason. So we can think of this as an application of the principle that within a person, parts that share more in reason are right to rule over parts that share less in reason. So we can see this as an application of principle one applied between people. So let's bracket the empirical claim first, whether there are people that share more in reason than others that share less in reason. And just think about the analogy. You might wonder, you might ask, okay, if premise one is true, what justification does the truth of one give us to apply this principle to arrangements between individual people? And you might think that the step doesn't follow because of the inherent dignity of the human person, but Aristotle is not operating with a, with a view in which persons have inherent dignity. We'll come back to this later. So then Aristotle reasons that natural slaves share less in reason than nobles, and so nobles are right to rule over natural slaves. This is the argument that I think Aristotle is making, and so let's turn to an evaluation of this argument. In discussions of Aristotle's views on slavery, Commentators make two points. The first is that Aristotle distinguishes individuals that are slaves by law and individuals that are slaves by nature. And Aristotle does argue that slavery by law is unjust because this is not reflective of how reason participates within an individual person. So Aristotle is thinking that the moral appropriateness of slavery depends upon facts of a human individual. It's not simply facts about power relationships between individuals. Second, so Aristotle writes in Politics, Book 1, Chapter 6, a slave is a sort of part of his master, a sort of living but separate part of his body. Hence, there is a certain mutual benefit and mutual friendship for such masters and slaves as deserves to be by nature so related. So we have to remember the context in which Aristotle is writing. He starts the politics by noting that the importance of a household, a small relationship between husband and wife, children and master and slave. And so Aristotle is thinking primarily of slavery along the lines of domestic slavery with a master and an individual. This is not a defense of chattel slavery. Okay, so those are the two things that people point out when discussing Aristotle's views on slavery to point out that it's quite limited and it is an important moral improvement of the views of the day. Another point that is made is that Aristotle's biological investigation should leave him questioning whether there are any natural slaves or whether there are enough natural slaves to justify the institution or the moral permission for domestic slavery. Aristotle is committed to the claim that the morality of domestic slavery depends upon facts of the individual. He thinks that in this case that the individual who is a natural slave is in some sense or another a defective human being. And so Aristotle should be in a position to realize that defective human beings are rare. It is here that we see again that Aristotle in some sense or another is still a product of his culture and unable to escape completely from the culture in which he is brought up. So let's recognize that it's very jarring to read what Aristotle writes about slavery. So I want to point out another passage in, at the end of Book One of the Politics that is extremely jarring. So Aristotle writes, most instances of ruling and being ruled are natural. For free rules slaves, male rules female, and man rules child in different ways, because while the parts of the soul are present in these people, they are present in different ways. The deliberative part of the soul is entirely missing from a slave. A woman has it, but it lacks authority. A child has it, but it is incompletely developed. So these are difficult words. A question that has been asked recently, and I will link the article from the New York Times, is whether we should cancel Aristotle on account of his abhorrent moral beliefs here. To cancel an individual is to indicate that not only that they are wrong, but that they are so wrong that their right to speak and their right to have their views heard in whatever median they had occurred is canceled. That that right is taken away and that we are not going to allow Aristotle's politics or Aristotle's ethics 
to be read. So there are a few things we should say about this, about whether Aristotle should be canceled. The first point is that we've seen is that people are a product of their cultures. There's no absolute reflective and luminous moral standpoint. Everyone is influenced by the particular culture that they are raised in. Some of us are able to reflect more so successfully than others for, for a variety of contingent reasons. But Aristotle here, you might think, has moved moral inquiry a little bit, but he hasn't moved it far enough. I mean, he's distinguished between a natural slave and a slave by law and argued that slavery by law, the, the kind that was very popular in the ancient world in which you know, one city would conquer another and enslave their population, that that's unjust. That's a very important moral discovery. But from our perspective, that's not near enough because he's still defending a form of slavery that doesn't endorse the, the importance of human dignity. And so that's the second point that I want to make is that by studying Aristotle's argument here, we can understand very clearly how he's reasoning and how that differs from our view that the human person has inherent dignity regardless of the function of that particular person. So the third point I want to make here is that by studying Aristotle's argument and by reading the politics and reading this particular part of the politics is that we come to a more realistic understanding of evil. We have a tendency to think of individuals that are beyond the pale as moral monsters where we can't comprehend how they would get themselves in that situation. And we have that view. It can be very difficult to see how horrendous evils can be perpetuated by very realistic human persons. But if we step back and study Aristotle in this context, we can appreciate more the realistic human face of evil and how evil can spread within a society. This also allows us to be more intelligent and successful in how we combat evil in our own day and age. So again, I would encourage you to continue to read Aristotle's politics, to think deeply about what Aristotle is up to in the politics. Now, we haven't discussed the other books of the politics that I've sent you. We don't have time for that, unfortunately. But as Aristotle starts off in the politics, he's very much interested in this view that a human person is a political or a social animal. So we are born into families. Families exist for their benefit. They are a part of nature. They naturally need to combine with other families to form a village for their benefit. And villages combine into city-states for their benefit. And so Aristotle is really fascinating to read here about how he thinks that you start with an individual person and that the person develops into a community, which then is incorporated into a larger community, which is then incorporated into another community. And that gives us an overall science of the human good, of human society. Now, there are a lot of very valuable discussions and valuable moral insights in Aristotle's politics, so I would encourage you to read that. We're going to end the course with a discussion of Aristotle's logic and Aristotle's philosophy of mathematics. So I'm looking forward to that. I will see you guys next week.